unfortunately, the plight of the veteran is not always recognized in every community. And we found in the last few years that more and more people realize that there is a need for veteran support. So many veterans come back from the war, you know, damaged psychologically, physically, hard to get a job, it's hard to assimilate back into society. And many things can be done to help them step back into their lives before they left for war. It was a joint event put together by Laurel, Laurel City Police Department and uh, the City of Tacoma Park. Just a way of uh, celebrating and celebrating our armed forces and military. Members of our emergency response team uh, had gotten together and discussed uh, what we could do in order to give back to the VFW and to the veterans of foreign wars. Foreign war. So um, in discussing it with them and, uh, and Laurel City Police Department, their emergency response team, uh, we came up with a plan uh, to, to uh, sponsor this event here for the veterans. So far things are going great. Everyone is, uh, is very happy to be here. They're glad uh, that we're sponsoring it with the uh, Lions Club. Uh, who's very supportive, the fire department as well, uh, and Laurel City Police. So. During my era, the draft was still in, so you had to pick some place to go. And uh, my family was Army or Air Force. I ended up in the Air Force. Um, I enjoyed it. It was a, a good learning experience. Uh, I was about 19 when I went in, done a year of college. That wasn't working for me. I learned a lot of things by being around a, such a diverse group of people, which I wouldn't do in my area, era, I've gotten a chance to be with. And also got to lead some of them. So I think it was a, a big learning experience. I think a lot of young people could use this. It does take some of the uh, decisiveness out of your thought process by going in the military and having uh, people train you to do certain things. And you grow up. I think a lot of us grew up there. I did time in uh, Southeast Asia. Um, wasn't bad, obviously. I'm 71 years of age. I'm still here. I would like to see the Veterans Administration offer more services and better services. Uh, sometimes I think they kind of let some of my people slip through the cracks. And when I say my people, I'm talking about all that served. A lot of things here that maybe don't always involve veterans. We also do a lot for children in our community. We do a big school drive supply drive every fall so that we can help for the underprivileged ch children that go to the two elementary schools in Tacoma Park. Um, we raise money for the Warrior Canine Connection which is an awesome program to place dogs with soldiers that have PTSD. Um, we raise money for the Feline Rescue Association to help get feral cats in the whole state of Maryland, you know, spayed, neutered, up to date on shots and if they can be adopted, they're adopted out. If they can't be adopted, we find barn homes for them or they may have to go back to their colony depending on how we assess them. We also we do many, many programs, suicide awareness, especially for veterans, uh, cancer research. We support the Vincent T. Lombardi Cancer Research Center um, and the Capital uh, Breast Care Cancer Center. We have many fundraisers through the year. We may not be able to give a whole lot of money at one time to everybody but we do make a difference in what we do. This uh, VFW Post 350 is such a fabulous piece of the Tacoma Park community, um, bringing people together um, with music, with conversation. Um, it's, uh, it's always great to be here for all kinds of events, and this, this uh, community really has, uh, we're really lucky to have the VFW here. They do so much, and it's nice to honor them and preserve Veterans Day, and uh, just showing them that we do care over here. Just a little, just the little things that we can do. We should, throughout the year, have a recognition of the kind of sacrifices that people are making and their families are making are in uh, military service. Um, but this, it's important to have at least one day a year to really recognize um, and thank thank people for their service and the sacrifices. And I, you know, my hope is always that it's not just a symbolic thank you, which I think we tend to do a little bit better of, but that we're also really expanding that to policies that support veterans, recognize the physical and mental health implications of having served in war, and, um, and really make sure that we're caring for the physical and mental health of veterans, of their families. We're considering service members and their families and the incomes that they're receiving and uh, making sure that people have the safety net services that they need. Uh, many times, you know, we think of this day, people are thinking nationally and internationally and in lifting up veterans. But we need to remember that veterans are in our community. They live here. They're here every single day. And we need to be supporting them 
in many ways and honoring them and to do it more frequently than just one day a year. Anybody that goes out and serves and defends our way of thinking, I, I think we should give them some time. I mean, after all, most of these guys gave the ultimate, and then a lot of them did give the four to 20 years. Yeah, of course, there were people that did two years were drafted, but they gave the time. And I think a lot of times when we look at our military today, you don't have that big drawer that we had. Where you're getting a lot of guys that are willing to give the two to 20 years to serve your country and your people. Uh, this is their day. Uh, they made the ultimate sacrifice, uh, and we're just doing whatever we can in order to support them um, in, in what they do. Every single person that has served in the military has helped, helped keep our country safe and help ensure our freedoms. These guys, these women, they basically take a step back from their lives and become basically government property, do whatever they're asked to do to ensure our safeties. And then two years later, four years later, or 20 years later, they retire and they've given so much of their lives to us that we need to celebrate the fact that someone is willing to do that for us. The After School Alliance is the actual organization who developed the Lights on After School program that highlights um, all the wonderful things that we do. They love it. They, they, love, the, they love cooking experience. Uh, they got to make a dirt, a Halloween dirt cups last year. Um, so they really enjoyed it. The parents also uh, enjoyed it as well too. We are a nonprofit organization based in Washington, D.C., and what we do is we focus on expanding uh, funding opportunities for after-school programs across the nation with a combination of federal funding, state-level funding, and, of course, local funding from uh, city groups as well. In addition to that, we also have private and public investment. Today is Lights on After School. It's the nation's only rally for after-school programs, and approximately one million Americans are going to be joining up at 8,000 programs across the country to celebrate after school programs and the impact that they have on our communities and our kids. My role is to really help promote the role of, of after school STEM programs, really how they can help excite children and young people in these, these STEM subjects, whether that's science, biology, physics, uh, engineering, math, um, different types of observational science and citizen science that we, we do in some of our programs. So what they learn in the school day in those classes, those science or math classes, sometimes when they're in high school, maybe those physics classes, really helping them understand and translate how that actually applies to the real world experiences. How can you apply what you've learned in those classes into a real hands-on experience? To see the kids actually come in and really like, their eyes were just like, they were bugging out. They, they loved it and it was a lot of fun putting it together. It's special because I think that seeing the kids enjoy themselves is, you know, kind of the reason why a lot of after school programs are you know, uh, around, you know, sometimes there aren't, you know, a lot of opportunities in different areas for kids to be able to, you know, get out of school and, and, and actually be able to come somewhere like a recreation department or even a community center and be able to do things that we do here. It really is a coast to coast and beyond celebration. We have people up in Alaska, down to Florida, and even over in Europe as well celebrating with us today. And that's everything from arts and crafts activities like we'll see today, to cooking demonstrations and um, citywide STEM parties. Today was special because we get to make stuff like food, and we got to make these headbands or bandana, but I choose a headband. I made some snacks and smoothie. I used bananas and apples, and I used sugar, yeah. honey. <laughs> and we made bowls of M&Ms and candy. All we did was cut up apples and bananas and put them in the blender with yogurt. With yogurt. <laughs> and um, we added um, cinnamon and honey. Today we did this... Um, race where we could do hurdles, we can um, do leap pads. We set up an obstacle course today for the kids to run. We had seven different stations um, and we tried to 
challenge them to complete it as fast as they could, but also as correctly as they could. So we had um, little ball tossing games. We had a little, uh, they had hurdles to jump over and things like that. So I think it was, uh, I think it went over pretty well. I like cooking, I like going outside, I like going to the gym, I like everything. I like going to the game room, I like going outside, I like playing with my friends. Ever since I moved to Maryland, like my friends at Aftercare have been most of my only friends here. But yeah, I, I made lots of friends here. I really like to go to the gym a lot. I like to jump rope and play double dutch. When we get in, we usually eat a snack. Then after, if you have homework, you go to a table, and then we do arts and crafts. My favorite activity was when we were making the pumpkins and we got to paint them our own way. One of my friends is named Marta. She's really nice and funny, and I appreciate for her and everything. And yes, I do make friends. Like the game we were playing, uh, we joined, even though we argue a lot, we, we, we're, we're, we still have friendship to, to each other. I've made a lot of friends. Really excited that we're going to go and make food. So there is these type of clubs, like art clubs, Spanish club, then other clubs. The counselors, they're really nice and they're really understanding. I make lots of friends. Um, well, sometimes I hang out with the people that I play with every day. For every one kid in these programs, there's two other ones that would want to be in these programs that just don't have access to them. So really helping expand access to those programs is our, our key mission. We like watch movies and go to the best friends. Our parents have to go to work, yeah. and if they don't have anyone to pick us up, they can just pick us up here when, they're, when, it's, um, when they come, and it's more easier to just... You just wait somewhere long instead of just coming to aftercare. I think it's important because if they if our parents were still at school, they wouldn't they wouldn't be able to go to work, and so that's why they could, I think if they drop if they, if we stay here and they go to work, they can stay there and then pick us up from here. I make friends. And there's two friends that I've known for probably three or four years. My favorite activity here is the where we go to the gym. And we offer homework help, and so we can give pretty much individual attention to um, your child um, when they're working on their homework. Uh, we try and make sure they get it done before they leave. We also provide them with a snack while they're here and they get plenty of exercise in the gym. We try and get at least half an hour of playtime for them. And so far the kids here have learned how to jump rope. Um, they've gotten really good at tagging each other. Um, so it's a good way to get exercise and to get, um, I guess, learn about a healthy diet. I have a lot of friends, a lot um, that I knew um, before. And I have teachers as friends like Miss Ash, Mr. Vince, and Miss Ish. We do arts and crafts, we color, and we sometimes do um, season related activities like when we um, painted pumpkins. I like to go to the gym a lot, especially free play when we can jump rope and do what we want to do. I know that some parents are not English isn't their first language, and it is kind of hard for them to be able to help their child when they're at home with homework, so we do that, and I know that it makes a big difference in, I guess, um, when they're at school. I mean, we don't know because we're not there, but when they come here, you know, um, they, they're more excited to get their homework done because they do get the help that they need, and sometimes it's done before they even get here, and the parents are pretty grateful, so homework is probably one of the biggest things I would say is a help. It's a huge range of impacts on our kids. That includes, obviously, academic gains from having extra homework help and tutoring at programs, as well as authentic STEM experiences and other things that um, they don't necessarily have time for in the school day, they can really begin to experience at their after-school programs. We also see great gains in social and emotional skills, including teamwork, communication skills, um, leadership skills, especially in some of our older youth as they begin to take on leadership roles in their programs. And it's also just a really good way for kids to explore what interests them, thrive in school, and get to have fun with their friends. I would really like to encourage uh, your viewers to please reach out to their members of Congress. We have a really easy um, short link 
3to6.co slash lights on rally. That will take them to a page where they can reach out to their congressman, either via social media or in an email, to really encourage them to protect this funding for future generations because it has been scheduled for elimination by the White House in two years running, and we want to make sure that this investment this is protected for our kids going forward. The Face Zone is a creative space where I imagine, draw, and write about it. What holds the pieces together is they all start with an illustration of a face of some kind. Could be a human face, an animal, an alien, something abstract. And then there's a little caption below the illustration. And to accompany the illustration, there's some kind of short poetic prose writing. Um, it's about whatever theme the art suggests. Um, and it's called the face zone because all the uh, illustrations have faces. And I like the word zone because it like open up this other imaginative world and space. And that's really the point of this work is to set mind in motion. I originally was a, a, a musician uh, by trade. And for a time I was away from that and I needed to come up with uh, something else to fill that creative void. So I really just started doodling for my own amusement and they all ended up being faces, I noticed. And then I had the idea to put these little captions below each one. And then that led to the writing, which led to the books, which led to the live show that I also do, where the, all the writing pieces are memorized. Um, and then when I do the spoken word part, like whatever the, the face art is, will be on a big screen next to me, projected. And then at some points during the show, I stop and do one of my original piano compositions just to kind of punctuate hearing me talk the whole time. Um, so it's art, words, and music to trip your imagination. Uh, tonight's exhibit is uh, really featuring the work of Joan C. Waits. She's from Silver Spring. I'm from Tacoma Park. And um, she uh, got her start sort of in the children's book world uh, with my book some almost 20 years ago. Okay, Now at that time, she was mostly an illustrator on educational books and that sort of thing. And uh, I learned about her in seeing a, a broadside that had the work of a number of artists and that, 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 that appealed to me. So I went to see her and uh, we sat down with my book and then it was a manuscript, uh, Little Ned Stories. So, so it was all put together. We went into the publishing uh, process and uh, printed more books than anybody would uh, for a first time book. 32,000, <laughs> right. First of all, I live in an older house, I had room for it. And everybody said, you're crazy, you'll never sell that. Well, I can say I'm now down to 900 books, but it took all them years to sell it. Uh, uh, after that book was completed, uh, and she continued to uh, do her educational book work, and also started to do land uh, in with some major publishers, like say in New York, but there as an illustrator only, and she started that work. But at the same time, she published other works of mine, notably The Balloon Galoon, which is on display here. Uh, she also did illustrations for my other books, The How-To Cowboy, here it was, uh, again, uh, ink drawings, and uh, a couple other books. It was uh, a collaborative, uh, process that worked perfectly as far as I'm concerned. And she liked it because very few illustrators get that opportunity, you know, to work with the actual writer, etc. Now in the meantime, she's still landing jobs with major publishers in New York as an illustrator. And at the same time, she was a teacher then. She taught at the Corcoran. She, by the way, now is teaching at the Writer Center in Bethesda. And she has a home studio. She illustrated approximately 15 books and last year she hit with her first book as author and illustrator, and that's being displayed. Here you will see a collection of my photographs combined with quotes by all of the US presidents that I collected. And the photographs are all mine. 
So my inspiration was to find something positive to put out or yeah, bring out in the cosmos. At a certain time, I thought I couldn't find inspirational sayings by all of them, but I didn't give up and kept on digging deeper. Some of the images did call out for quotes. Some of the quotes did call out for photos. And I had a few aha moments when I read something and then I remember, oh, I have an image that describes this exactly. And then I had to find that image and like remember, oh, when, I, when did I take it? Where is it? But the, I, I know I have an image that describes this exactly. I took thousands of images. It's a two-year project. Selecting quotes from difficult time period in history was challenging for me since I was focusing on uplifting messages. I was driven by presidential words that have universal meaning at the time they were spoken and even now. I have several series of paintings up in the show today. Um, most of them are based on a sketching that I do at concerts do a lot of live sketching kind of wherever I go and uh, the paintings are loosely based on real local musicians. I usually alter the faces, alter the compositions quite a bit from the original sketches. I'm not necessarily concerned with uh, them representing the original person and more just about the feeling and the emotion of the moment. Uh, there's also a number of the paintings have either comics or elements of comics in them. Some of the comics are very abstract. It's sort of just about the idea that every musician is telling a story, and so there's a lot of work related to that. And then I also have a lot of work in right now that has um, uh, recycled materials and reclaimed materials. Uh, I work at a social work program for artists with disabilities, and there's always uh, leftover materials at the end of the day, particularly a lot of leftover paint. And so instead of washing it down the drain and letting it get it into our water systems, uh, we let it dry and then I collage with the, those materials. I personally find sketching live to be way easier. There's very little uh, requirements in your sketchbook other than whatever you want. So there's just, it's yours and you, you don't necessarily have to share that with anybody. Whereas if I'm doing something in my studio, the intent is that it's going to be public. I want it to be out there. I think some of the paintings involve very clear color schemes. So if, if it's a drawing from a concert, um, I might try and ape the, the lighting display from the show. Um, if, it's a, if it's a particular mood, you know, I might try and tone it down a little to focus on that mood. I gotta say though, in a lot of cases, I just sort of go with colors that feel right in the moment. Um, and I think a lot of that just goes back to sketching. It's just whatever I'm feeling in the moment. It is an installation of um, my fiber works that I do. Um, fiber figures, some people might call them dolls, and I create them from reclaimed materials. I create them from pants. So in some descriptions I call them pants dolls. They're all made from denim jeans or other types of pants, and some of them are painted, some of them have original material, and then I adorn them with other types of reclaimed materials mainly. About six years ago, I was part of uh, an exhibit in Charleston, South Carolina called the uh, Black Mermaids and Mere Women exhibit put together by Toria Washington. And all of the artists created either quilts or figures to represent black water creatures. And I chose Olokun, which is an African spear for the deep ocean. And so all the figures that you see in the installation are inspired by Olokun. And it's been a project for me that has been about environmental justice, uh, to honor our ecosystem, our water, to kind of remind us to respect the earth. And it's also in honor of all the millions of Africans who perished, survived, or descended from the African slave trade, the transatlantic slave trade. So the project has meant a lot to me just in terms of dealing with Olokun as that deep ocean spirit 
that would govern the realm where our ancestors' bones settled during the Atlantic slave trade. It's, it's been really important to me to work with reclaimed materials. I found that the fashion industry, especially the industry that creates denim jeans, is one of the most polluting industries. So in terms of it honoring the ocean and the water, it's been important to work with reclaimed fabrics. I'm not adding to the stream of material created. I'm using something that's already been created and I'm reclaiming it. The other things in the installation are other found objects or things that I've created. Wood, plastic, metal, ceramic pieces to kind of represent objects in space. Certainly for Tacoma Park, for holding affairs like this and uh, displaying the work of artists, local artists, um, very few, and they do it sort of like on two month cycles. Uh, so over the course of a year, people come to the community center, come to the library, computer room, get to see a quite a large uh, uh, display of art. It's great for artists to have this opportunity to participate in exhibition like this and be a part of a team and a part of the community. One of the things I've learned during this project is that it's so important to get outside of what are traditional gallery spaces where very few people circulate and put art in spaces where everyday people who may not go to a gallery can see your art. So I really appreciate that, you know, hundreds of people, if not thousands, will pass through this space during the course of the show. I think communities where the arts are celebrated, where people can have access to participation as either as creators or as uh, audience members, it always enhances the quality of life for that zip code.